righty. So our next speaker is our co-CEO, Kathy Fetke. Most of you know Kathy. She's been chatting around with a lot of you in the back of the room. All right, so Kathy is our co-CEO. I'm not going to overdo everything because Rich talked about a lot of it, but she's got the two podcasts. She's got the two books. She's always looking for great deals for a real wealth network market and new markets for us to talk about. She's scouring the country, meeting with people. Pinning Kathy down is kind of like impossible sometimes because she's a whirling dervish flitting around the country getting stuff done. We're all having to keep up with her. But uh, Kathy, you want to you wanna come on up here and talk about 2018? Let's give a big hand for Kathy Fecky, everybody. Ah, so are you ready to hear exactly what's coming this year? Yep. Absolute with precision <laughs> forecasting. Um, I will do my best. I got to say, in the, in the past year, I was pretty right on. The year before that, I failed miserably because I thought we were going to see a stock market correction. Did anybody else think that might happen? Anybody taken a bit surprised that it went the opposite? Who knew that was going to happen and made a bunch of money by staying in the market? All right. <laughs> OK, one of you is going to give the next forecast. All right. <laughs> All right. So to, uh, today I'm going to give you my top five strategies for investing in 2018. But please understand there are a whole lot more strategies out there. I bet a lot of you are doing different kinds of things. So this is going to be a very narrow fo focus uh, for, for different reasons. Um, we, you know, we don't spend a lot of time on multifamily and for, the, for, for, again, lots of reasons. But right now, because cap rates are so low. And generally, with multifamily, uh, the idea, the way that you make a lot of money is not necessarily on a, on a five cap, but on um, hopefully raising rents, lowering expenses, and being able to make money on the valuation of the property because it's worth more because it's cash flowing more. But if you're getting it at a four cap, is someone going to buy it at a three or a two? Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? But um, that's just not, that's a little speculative uh, for me. And that's why we won't um, be focusing so much on multifamily. The, the, the point is there's so many options and it's most important that you find the option that works for you and become really, really good at that. So that's one of the things that we've become good at is single family homes and, uh, and land development. So it kind of came to us by accident, but it just turns out that it's exactly what's needed today. So let's start with, well, the disclaimer, um, I'm doing my best with the research I have and the time I spent and the many people I talk to out there um, and, and so many of you investors in the room. And um, at the end of the day, it's your money. And so just use, use my ideas, but, um, but certainly do your own research, your own due diligence, speak with your own advisors, attorneys, and CPAs, because I will be giving some tax talk. And, and here's my disclaimer. Talk to your CPA about what I said, but don't just run out and do what I did based on what Kathy said, because I'm not a CPA. All right. So number one, anything I say will not matter if you don't have the right mindset. And this is just probably the most important piece. I know Rich went over it a little bit earlier, uh, but I, I have the wonderful opportunity, as do our investment counselors and everyone at Real Wealth Network, to see how you all are doing. We have 36,000 members now. And we get to really, obviously, we don't get to know everybody, but we get to see a lot of what people are doing and who's succeeding and who just doesn't for whatever reason. Like Some people find the process very difficult, while others just breeze right on through. And I would like to kind of compare the wealth mindset to uh, kayaking or something. Um, when, when Rich and I went whitewater rafting with the family, uh, anybody done that, kayaking or whitewater rafting? So the water's there, right? The flow of energy is there. And that's kind of like money. It's the, the river is there. How you flow down it, is, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, you know, it can be terrifying. I was terrified, so I was afraid to fall into the water, uh, whereas other people don't find that scary at all. Um, and then other people, you, you might be cruising right along and then see another boat that's just stuck 
you know, just stuck. It's just not moving. The water's moving, but the boat's not. It's just stuck somewhere. So why? Is it because they didn't quite know how to maneuver through it? Or you know, what was the obstacle? Because it wasn't the water. It was maybe the driver of the boat. So uh, the wealth mindset, I, I, I've seen so many times, even with my close friends and family, when they don't have this in place, you could put the best deal, just the money maker, the winner of a lifetime in front of them, and they can't see it. Have you ever noticed that? Like you, you told someone about a deal and they're like, oh, what? You know, that's, that's crazy, you're not gonna make any money on that or that can't be real or whatever. They, they, they can't see it if they don't have um, some of these things, which would be starting with the abundance mentality, which is a bit of an open mind. Uh, it's, it's not too open though. <laughs> when I say um, an open mind, it's like willing to hear and learn um, that doesn't necessarily mean jump in. So, you know, to use the comparison of, of whitewater rafting, um, the water's there, the boat is there, you could jump in, but you could capsize, you could flip over, you could get stuck. Um, so, you know, it helps to have a guide. It helps to know what you're doing and how to do it. And if you have those things, you can just, just cruise right on down and it becomes fairly simple and a lot of fun. Whereas otherwise, it, it can even become dangerous if you don't have those things in place. So having an open mind, but also with that, learning, being committed to learning. I, I'll just give you an example of two people recently, very close to me, one is family and one is a close friend. Both had 1031 exchanges in the last couple of months. Um, partly based on hearing me say, this is a great time to sell California property. It's, peaked, you've got a lot of equity, you could do something with that. You can put that equity to work, make some money. This is the opportunity of a lifetime to do that. It doesn't come up all the time that you can sell at the peak and buy, you know, exchange it for cheap properties elsewhere. Uh, but you have that opportunity. So both said, I want to do that. Now one is the family member who just, it's funny because a lot of family, a lot of times fam most of my family has never been to an event. I have my niece here, which is wonderful. But most, most of my family, don't, you know, they don't come to these events. And, but this family member just decided, wow, I want to do this. This makes sense. And then she just got obsessed, just started listening to our webinars, our podcasts, reading my book, um, reading all kinds of books, looking in, you know, watching our webinars. And, and go, she visited the markets, and she really learned so that when... And, and did a lot of counseling sessions with our investment counselors and is an extremely analytical person. And so she gathered, she spent a lot of time on this knowledge piece. So when she sold her property, she was ready and she knew what she wanted. She knew what the returns would be in which market. She'd already talked to the providers in those areas and her 1031 was fairly seamless. And, and she went from selling a, a high-priced, way overpriced property, um, just really a dump, honestly. I mean, that's, that's what you can do today. You put a sign out and you could, don't even have to fix anything up. So um, although they did, she got top dollar and had, you know, did this exchange and has dramatically increased her cash flow. And I compare that to another friend who doesn't listen to any of my webinars or podcasts or anything. And, um, and did sold a two million dollar piece of property, and is down to two weeks right now. She's she's down to two weeks to identify the replacement property, and is freaking out. So she's the one in the boat that is like holding on for dear life, and it feels like it's going over the edge, and she feels like she's flipping around. It's not a pleasant experience. So you know the wealth knowledge. It's much much better to get all of that done in advance. If any of you are thinking of doing a 1031. Make sure you do your homework up front because you've got 45 days to learn what takes a long time to learn, you know. So those would be, you know, the most important things. And the reason I bring this up is, is with my friend with the $2 million exchange, I have, because she's my friend and I have a lot of contacts, and I was able to find some unbelievable deals for her, like really, like things I can't give to everybody because they're rare. Um, and they come up, you, you know, I can't count on it coming up, but a couple of deals came up that were just fabulous. And, you know, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to pass on it myself. Or, you know, you can have this, this will, this, you can at least use this to identify so that you have a little, you can breathe. 
And she'd be like, oh, thanks, thanks. And the next day, yes, my broker said that can't be, you know, can't be a good deal. 10%, you can't get 10%. Um, so, you know, that, okay, well then get this. This is, this is gonna be a really good deal, this is great. Um, no, you know, she, she'd be like, thanks so much the next day. Oh yeah, so-and-so told me um, that, that that's not true. <laughs> great, well then have so-and-so find you a property, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And so, so-and-so did, and it's um, maybe fine. I don't know, it's a Wendy's. Anybody invest in a Wendy's? And it's like a four cap, so I don't know. And she said that, you know, so-and-so said this was safe, and I want safe. And I said, great, well then, hopefully Wendy's is going to be in business for a while. <laughs> you know, what, is there anything that is totally safe? I mean, everything has risk, right? Even the things that your broker might say, uh, you know, this, this is the safest, like bonds or whatever. You know, everything needs to be questioned. And uh, so anyway, enough about that. But the more you know, the less you'll be fearful. So if you feel fear, it just means you need to learn more. That's all. And so give yourself time to learn and not two weeks. <laughs> you know, um, don't, don't get yourself into a situation where you have to move quickly and can't take the time to learn. And then um, third is values first. And I will say, you know, you got to hear my husband, who is an amazing man. I actually had a shaman tell me he's a shaman, but he doesn't know he's a shaman. But if anybody feels different, that's why. But I think he doesn't know. He's got magical powers. Anyway, <laughs> um, values first. This, this is something he's taught me over the 22 years that we've been together. Uh, that when you really understand your values, like really to the core, what makes you happy and, and what you're going to remember on your deathbed and, and what truly brings you joy, then everything falls in line. And if you don't know that, then the world will pull at you and things will feel more stressful. So with Rich, he's very clear about his values. It's, it's not difficult for him. He knows what matters. And you know, it's his health, it's his family, it's his peace of mind, uh, fun. You know, these are things, not, not anywhere on that values list will you see great investments. Or even though that's important to him for sure, but not more important than his values. And so I am opposite of him, and I move really quickly, at least in the past, not anymore. Uh, but when we first started investing, I didn't spend as much time on number two, so the wealth part. So I would just trust somebody, and wow, this sounds like a great deal. Let's do this. And, uh, and on some things, he just kind of let me just do it, and it didn't always turn out. And there were a few things that went real bad, and we lost a lot of money based on um, choices I had made. And because Rich knew his values, which was a happy marriage, that was more important than those losses, then it just wasn't that painful. It was just like, oh, it's only money. You know, I have you, we have our family. We, you know, can still go ski and, or hike. Let's say we have no money to ski, we can still go hike, you know? <laughs> or we could do like my nephews and, and go just hike up a mountain and ski down it. We don't have to pay for a lift pass. Uh, what, whatever it is, you know, we, we've come on hard times and a lot of times it was because of me. And, in 2009, it was a rough time. I, I think there was, was one, one, one moment we had to walk into the office and tell people they weren't going to get paid that month. We had about 250 bucks in the real wealth account, and uh, there was no payroll. And, and again, you know, there wasn't a moment that he made me feel like a loser for that. You know? And that's, that's, that's knowing your values. It's kind of like, and because of that, it kept, I kept going and used all of those lessons to be able to tell you not to do those things. <laughs> really, that's really important. I wouldn't want to stand up here and give you any advice if I hadn't you know, gone down that river a few times and messed up a few times, but now I know how to go down it and I can show you where. Don't go there and avoid that, but if you go this way, you could have a nice fun ride. So I, it's, it's worked for us, um, but it's kind of like, you know, Understanding number three is if you've ever gone somewhere that was kind of hard to get to and expensive, like Disneyland, that's a pain, right? 
it's expensive, you park far away, you walk through crowds, you know, all this. It's like it took a lot of effort, or skiing, or something like that, where it's, a, it's, it's kind of a pain. And you see, um, I, we were sitting at this table once at breakfast, and this dad was just chewing out his kid, you know, and, and that she had forgotten the gloves in the car or something like that. And a little, little girl, maybe 10, and just, just chewing her out, and it's just, you know, this, oh, I was like, honey, go talk to him and tell him to remember his values. <laughs> you know, what matters more, the gloves or the kid? You know, we got to have these things in perspective. The gloves don't matter. You go and you have a nice walk back to the car. So, you know, when we get this right, everything falls in line. And then uh, personal responsibility. This is a huge one that I see a lot of, a lot of people, obviously, it's a cultural thing where people want to blame someone else, and usually for financial reasons. Um, you spill your coffee or whatever, you, you, you can have the chance to sue someone. Obviously, if, if you've been wronged, then, you know, a lawsuit's okay. But and too often, we've seen people not take responsibility for the choices they made and want to blame somebody. Um, maybe they didn't get their inspection on the property, or they didn't get their appraisal. They didn't do the things they're supposed to do. Um, they didn't educate. Whatever it is, uh, it's, it's so easy to want to blame someone else. But I can tell you that mentality will block wealth. It will block your wealth. It, it is, like I said, this river of wealth it needs to be able to flow. And, um, and when we come from this abundance mindset, take responsibility, that is what opens the valve. And thinking small or, or um, selfishly or there's not enough or blaming somebody else, these are the things that block it. And, you know, there's been times we lost money at, several times trusting someone else and we could have definitely sued them, maybe should have. But at the end of the day, when we sat down and looked at it, it was like, yeah, but we didn't really read the documents that carefully. Or, you know, we were in Nicaragua and had one drink too many and bought that stupid condo that never got built. You know, maybe we shouldn't have had that last drink. You know, <laughs> never sign a contract when somebody is making sure you've had three drinks first, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we lost some money on that. But uh, yeah, so, and, and so it just was like, yeah, let's just move on. And with that, with that thinking, first of all, you let go of so much baggage. And I can tell you, how many people do you, let's see, do you think most successful people have experienced some kind of loss? Yeah, has, has people in this room experienced some kind of loss? Absolutely. And, and has it made you wiser and stronger and better, right? And in a lot of cases, because of that, you make more the next time around. And it, the main goal is to just make sure you win more than you lose. But to kind of go into investing like you're never going to lose, and then you do, it hurts. But if you go in saying, I'm going to lose a few times, but those are going to be lessons, and I'm going to use those lessons to make more money, then again, it just it, it makes the process a lot easier. I said on one of the shows, on one of my real shows, that um, this couple invested in this property and lost $60,000 and it nearly cost their marriage. And I thought, wow, that is a really low price tag for your marriage. You know, if it's only worth $60,000, maybe you should walk away, you know? Um, but, you know, I guarantee you that on their next deal, they're going to make $60,000 more than they expected, just because they learned and because they kept going and because they put their values in the right place, hopefully. All right, and finally, just be cool. Just be cool. And this network, you almost have to be because, um, you know, you've got, we're in an environment that I'm going to talk about, but um, it's harder to find deals. Being the investor is not uh, the strong position these days. I'm just being honest. There's a lot of money out there, and there's not a lot of deals. And so if you're not cool, people don't want to work with you. If you're difficult, if you aren't nice, if you're overly demanding, it isn't the environment that, that it's going to work. It's just not going to work. 
People want to work, want to know that you're going to be in business together long term. I'll bring my friend back again. She ended up being so difficult. I was like, I've had her talk to three or four of like these really high level investors, and she she'll come to them and and be like, ah, it's not a good deal. You know, no one's going to help her anymore. No one wants to help her anymore. It's too bad. So you know, again, just be cool. All right. So now let's go on to. Number two, now we're going to get into data. So once you have really got the wealth mindset, then you can see opportunity, or at least be open to it. At least be open. That's all I wanted my, friends to, my friend to say was, oh, tell me more. Not, this, doesn't, this, can't be right. this can't be true. This can't be right. So understand the market you in, you're in. Because if you don't, if, if you're making decisions based on what you heard a year ago or two years ago or 10 years ago, it's probably not uh, you know, going to work in today's market. Things are changing too quickly. You've really got to understand where things are today. So where are we today? And this is a, just a quick snapshot of, of where we are. Now, this could be different six months from now. And it's a little different than it was six months ago. It's a lot different than two years ago. So some of you haven't been to an event for a couple of years, and welcome back. It's great to have you here. Things are going to be really different. Sometimes I feel like when I say things, it sounds like high-pressure sales, and I don't mean it to be that way. It's a, a couple of years ago, I remember saying, you got to get in this market because it's changing quickly, and if you don't, it'll be too late. And that's the case now. There's markets that have changed so much that they're not good anymore. They don't make sense anymore. But there's other markets and other opportunities that do. So just because you heard me say something last year or the year before or five years ago, it may not be true today and probably isn't. So this is the, uh, again, the snapshot of where we are. We have an expanding economy, right? Everybody knows that. This is the second longest expansion. And if it goes another year, it will be the longest. And that's concerning because we know that markets go up and down. And two years ago, I was the one going, it's about, to go, it's about to crash. Be careful. Be cautious. And then it didn't. And, and everybody was confused. Like, what is happening? So this might help explain it a little, is that even though it's one of the longest expansions, it's also one of the slowest. And that's because it, it was almost dead, really. Like you, you need to go back and, uh, what is that? What is the book? The, the Big Short? The, the, everybody, did anyone not see The Big Short? You, you, gotta, you gotta go see it, you gotta read it. It is terrifying. But in 2008, our economy died. And it, it collapsed. Like the, the ter most terrifying thing happened that a lot of people don't really realize how bad it was. A lot of people do, but it's like, it got covered up, but our banking system collapsed. I talked about it in um, the December forecast. I, you know, basically that we have a system where there's really not, um, you know, if you have deposit your money in the bank, it's actually not there. It's being lent out to somebody else. So if all of us wanted to go to the bank and get our money back out, you, you can't. It's not there. It's, it's somewhere else. And the reason that works is because not everybody goes to get their money at the same time. But in 2008, because of all the, you know, the, the um, delinquencies, it did happen and we had a complete and total banking failure that was fixed through quantitative easing, which isn't really a fix. But it did do the job. It, it was a band-aid. So as a result, it was like reviving a dead economy. And it's taken longer. And it took a lot. It took trillions of dollars to bring this economy back to life. Um, but it, it, it has. It's all borrowed money, and it's all fake, but it did work. So um, <laughs> just being honest. So, um, so because of that, it's been a long, slow recovery. And to compare it, like I, it says here, it's been 19% uh, GDP growth versus 39% in the 80s and 43% in the 90s in their recovery. So that might explain why this could go longer than what would be normal. 
And a, a lot of economists are saying it, it may be another year and a half, two years before we see some kind of um, recession. And that was my forecast in December that I think 2018 is going to be a good year. I don't think we're going to see that recession this year. I could be wrong, but with all the tax breaks and the enthusiasm out there, I think we're going to have another year of, of great opportunity. With the not, with in the back of your mind knowing, but there's something still lurking, and we need to be aware of what that is and, and make sure we're not too confident that we, we, we go out and make deals, but that they're deals that can handle a potential recession, because it is coming, it's just a matter of when. Um, so there we are, this expanding economy that's based on fake money and is gonna probably play for another year, maybe two, but at some point there will, you know, you do have to pay debt back. That's how usually it works. At some point, you know, when will that be? I don't know. But at some point, you know, you can't keep bringing in the monopoly money forever. Um, then, so as a result of this, uh, we've had job growth. The job growth hasn't been um, high, high wage job growth, but there has been job growth. Um, we just in the last report, it was 2% of wage growth in new jobs. I believe in existing jobs, it was closer to 4%. Um, so keep that in mind that there is job growth. It tends to mostly be the lower paying jobs and, um, and pretty, pretty low wage growth. And, but with that job growth and with the population growth, there is a massive demand for housing. We have a lot of household formations. A lot of them, millennials, are moving out. They're out of college. They want to go live on their own. Um, so you're, you're seeing household formation. And while there is um, an increase in millennials buying homes, most are renting. So we're definitely sit, still seeing rent growth. So all that new household formation is creating a demand for housing. But we don't have new housing to keep up with it. So normally, you need about a million and a half new homes every year to keep up with growth. And that, uh, it, we're behind. I know a lot of you have heard my shows and, and, and know why, but the, the summary of it is that builders got wiped out, just absolutely wiped out in 2008. I think it was one of the big national builders that, I think it was, it lost 80% of, of, their, of their land holdings. They just, you know, and this is a big company, I won't say the name because I'll probably get it wrong, but um, they really got hit hard and they're in no hurry to do that again. And probably couldn't even get the financing if they wanted to and don't want financing, they just want to, they don't even want to do entitlement anymore, they just want to find a property they can build and make a 10% margin and move on and just not suffer again. And so, um, build, you know, we're just not seeing the kind of building that we've seen or that we need with the household growth. So with the lack of supply, Stronger demand, we're seeing home prices rise and um, more, you know, just less affordability, uh, more difficulty with people being able to find a place to live that they can afford, whether it's rent or home ownership. So you can see here with rising home prices, 7% on average and rents going up similarly, but wage growth only at 2%, there's a problem there. And that's where we're meeting, that's where we're seeing the affordability issues. And then add on to that, we're going to see interest rates go up. Just going to further, um, we're going to see a further decline in home, home ownership most likely because of that. So here's the slide that shows what I was talking about, the fake money part. Um, you can see that first blue line is the um, tech bubble and the recession during that time and 9-11. Um, and so does anyone remember back then that we had just a complete shock to our economy after 9-11 and needed a kind of a restart? And it was one of the first times we did massive quantitative easing. There was a lot of money thrown in. In retrospect, it was really not very much money compared to what has been. But at the time, you can see the money supply. This basically means the creation of money out of thin air put into the economy. Right after that recession, it was unprecedented the amount of, of money or the expansion of the money supply to revive the economy after that shock. And you can see where it went up. 
Then the next one is the Great Recession. You can see that line goes quite a bit longer, way more intense. And the only way that we knew how to solve this problem was to throw a whole lot of money into the economy, unprecedented. And you, you know this, so I'm not, I don't have to preach to the choir, but I want to remind you that this is the reason we have anything going on in our GDP. This is it. You, you, can, you can point fingers at policies and whatever you want, the presidents or, this is it, okay? It's the Federal Reserve. It, this is the only reason we're experiencing um, massive growth. So, and it, I'm sorry, it's the only reason we're, we're experiencing any growth. It's not massive, it's 2%. It's really not that impressive. So if you want to kind of like basically, see, it, if, you, if you were in debt and you were kind of struggling and someone was like, here, let me just give you a mound of money, do you think you might be able to recover? You know, as long as, you know, as long as you never had to pay that back, right? <laughs> You know, like what if, if, you, if you had debt and you were struggling and I was like, here, let me just give you a few million. Is that going to be okay? And you're like, yeah, okay. And you're going to go do stuff and hopefully get things going again. And, and then I'm like, okay, I need that two million back. You know, if you did things right, you might have it. If you didn't, you might not. You know? And then you're in real trouble. So... This isn't necessarily money that we're going to pay back. You know, this is just an infusion of fake money into the, into the economy. But at the same time, the Fed is tightening. That is their policy right now. Their, the last 10 years was, was just uh, expansion, expansion, expansion. Money, 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 money. Just take it, make, make the country better. Um, now the Fed is reversing that by raising interest rates and unwinding the balance sheet. So it's the opposite of this is about to start. And so it's just important to recognize that if the expanding the money supply is what maybe created, helped create this expansion, what could reverse it? And that would be a tightening. So again, you could say, yeah, but we have a new president and there's these policies or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. What matters is this. It, what matters is what the Fed does and how much they're willing to tighten versus how much they're willing to put more money into it. So that's what you need to keep your, your eye on when making decisions in the future. For now, I think those changes are gonna be so minimal and that the tax reform is gonna offset it because it'll be such an incredible stimulus that I don't think we're gonna feel it right now. So we're good for a little while. So back to housing supply. Um, Recessions, basically, the, you know, what, what happens in a recession is people lose their jobs, and housing is completely and totally, and real estate in general, dependent on the economy and people having jobs. So that's got to be the thing that we pay attention to as real estate investors. How's the economy doing? So anytime you see those steep you know, housing supply, there's way too much supply, you could see it's during a recession, and that's because people are losing jobs. And then when people start to get jobs, then you have a lack of housing because when there was too much housing, builders stopped building, and all of a sudden people start getting jobs, and then there's not enough housing, and there's a catch-up. So that's where we are right now. We're down there um, at low, low inventory levels. Not the lowest ever, but low. And that drives prices up. And this is just over the past year. And so usually the solution is new housing, right? So you just build new stuff, and then you don't have a problem. But um, as you can see here, the, the bottom, I don't think the colors are coming in. So yeah, that, um, the top line is the, it's the yellow one, is the new homes being built, and then, or new homes for sale, and then construction of single family homes. So you can see that we're not anywhere near uh, where we need to be on keeping up with demand. And that's a problem because we're growing as a country and forming lots of new households. So again, just, just a reminder that this is what the issue is right now. It, go, it fluctuates. As soon as a recession would hit, we would see this reverse. So nothing is permanent. Nothing is permanent. Right now, we have a housing shortage. Six years ago, we had way too much. 
So never get too comfortable with where you are. This is just temporary, and this is where we are right now. But if there were a recession, suddenly there would be more supply. Uh, but here are some of the demographic changes that we're seeing. Uh, that we know we've got millennial growth. Um, and this is according to John Burns. Over the next 10 years, this would be the household change by age group. 25 to 44 years old, uh, basically the millennial group, an increase of 3.3 million. Then according to him, the family age, there's, it's actually going to be less, a you know, decline in, in that age group of, of the family growth. And then a massive growth in our aging population, 65 and up in retirees because so many baby boomers will be crossing over into um, 65 and up. So again, important to pay attention to the millennials and even more so maybe the, you know, the baby boomers. Where are they headed? What are they doing? Where are they retiring? And this is just another slide to show uh, housing inventory. So supply of homes is the yellow line. When you've got low supply, you've got high prices, which is the higher line at the beginning. And then when you've got high supply, low prices, and then it just reverses. And right now, we have low supply, so home prices are at all new highs. And there you have it. So this is the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. And this is uh, all US homes, so you can see we're, we're at all new highs na nationwide. San Francisco is even higher than, much, much higher than its last high. And I, I like showing this slide because I still have lots of people come to me after events and say, yeah, but even though it's new highs, it's San Francisco, you know, or it's, it's San Jose. I mean, nothing can happen here. You can always make money in California. Is that true? Has that been true for you? Not, maybe. Okay, so if you hold it, if you hold it long enough. So if you bought way back there down, you know, <laughs> at the beginning, um, and you held it, you, you wouldn't even care about that last downturn because it's still more than you paid if you bought in the beginning. But what a lot of people fail to see is that if you time it wrong in, in California or other high-priced markets, you will lose money. You know, if for a little while, and not if you hold it forever, but if you bought at the last peak, and then there was the housing downturn, and you were hoping just to get your money back, it would have taken you 10 years. So if you bought in 2006 or 2005, your house would have gone down in value, and it may have just come back to the price you paid last year, or maybe this year, or maybe you're not there yet. So to, to believe that you can always make money in California is just not true. You can definitely make a ton of money if you time it right, or if you hold for a long time. So one of the two. But the reason I say that is so many people will tell me, yeah, but I'm cash flowing here. Really? You know, like, how? Well, I, you know, I don't have a mortgage. Uh, well, then you better be cash flowing. <laughs> I mean, you know, that would be really bad if you were negative cash flow and own the property clear, free and clear. But what a lot of times what they're not seeing is the value of the property today. So maybe they have a super low mortgage on it and so it feels like they're cash flowing. But if you were to look at the actual value of the property and exchange it for like kind, for property, the same amount, so maybe you paid 500,000, it's worth 2 million, but you think you're cash flowing because you're basing it on the 500,000. But if you sold it and bought $2 million worth of property, you would quadruple your cash flow easily. So that's what, uh, you know, it's just important to, to be able to look at this and say, hmm, you know, it, based on history, there could be a downturn coming. This could be a good time to cash in and, um, and be able to cash flow better somewhere else and kind of wait out the storm that way rather than have everything in one property. All right. Los Angeles, not quite at the peak, not yeah, almost at where it was in the last peak. Not quite as bullish as San Francisco. Um, but then I put some other slides in here so you can just see what, um, what other cities are doing and why we like some of these cities. This is Chicago. Chicago has not yet come back to its last high. So we still think there's room for growth there and there's cash flow. 
Cleveland, same thing. Um, prices have gone up almost to where they were the last peak, but not in every uh, neighborhood. So there's still the chance to get uh, property really, really cheap. And anyway, like the, <laughs> the average price there is 140,000 versus you know a million. So you you know even though you're looking at these slides and you could say, hmm, I could have 10 of these Cleveland properties or one in San Francisco. You know, which would be safer? You know, if I, if I have five vacancies, I'm still making more money in Cleveland than if I had one vacancy in San Francisco. Or if, I had, if there was a natural disaster in San Francisco, now I'm 100% out, whereas if I've got 10 properties elsewhere, they're diversified. And the interesting thing about this slide is that properties were, even though they kind of peaked in 2005, it was still undervalued compared to the rest of the country. This is an interesting slide. A lot of people want to you know, invest in Dallas. And Dallas is booming. You know, there's no question. It's, it's booming with jobs. It's just not as good a deal as it used to be. And that's why. So Rich and I bought in 2004, 2003. And um, we, had a, we had a massive uh, bubble here in California, right? So it was the same thing where we had this chance to sell at the peak and buy in Texas at the bottom. And, um, you know, and they had a recession. They went through the Great Recession, but not that bad. It was really not that bad. And the neighborhoods that we bought in, nothing. But um, in fact, you know, it, rents just went up. Since then, Dallas has just become, you know, the place everyone wants to invest. And you can see, is it is it still a good time to buy there? We are personally finding it very difficult to find numbers that work. That doesn't mean that you can't find a deal there. Uh, we, you know, we've got teams if people really just want to be in Dallas, but this is kind of a good example of why it's just harder. It's getting harder. So if you heard me talk five years ago and I was like, Dallas is awesome, that's because we were just at the beginning of that boom. It's changed a lot. Detroit, Detroit's had a pretty major comeback. You see it's a lot later than Dallas was. Um, and it has a lot to do with their bankruptcy. So after you know, they, they filed bankruptcy, they were a city having a lot of this issues, terrible crime, terrible housing crisis. But two billionaires have invested a couple billion each and have, are just completely revitalizing that city. And in the last three years, it has had a major turnaround, which you can see, but not quite at its last peak. So this is a city that we find interesting, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, and then here is a graph on new home sales. So remember I was saying we really need new homes to make up for this lack of inventory. But when home prices have gone up that much past their last peak, it's hard. You know, even if builders are bringing in new supply, it may not be the right supply. It may not be what's needed out there. And there's a reason for that. It's really expensive to build these days. It's really hard. It takes a long time to get the permits you need. There's apparently 30% higher costs from contractors and materials, and um, it, it, there's 200,000 openings and, and jobs. So that you know, there's the labor market's not there, so they have to pay more for labor. So the bottom line is the new home price has gone up dramatically. So even builders who are trying to bring in supply, it may not be what people need, the affordable housing that's needed out there. So uh, the kind of blue area below is, is uh, the, it says the weakest wage growth in years. And then the white line is the median home price. So you've got prices going up, but wage growth kind of pathetic. And then add to it that finally interest rates are going to go up. It's such a bummer because we didn't get the loan in time. <laughs> we didn't lock it. And oh, we had just like, we're trying to refi our house and try to get this deck. Anybody heard about our deck? It's just, we st still don't have it two years later. But that not having that deck, we weren't able to get our loan and we were able to lock it in at like three and a half percent. Anyway, now it's too late because ra rates are just going up now. It just doesn't even make sense to, to refi anymore. So this time they are going up. And the reason for that is because the Fed is trying to rebalance um, is, or trying to uh, off offload its balance sheet. And what that means is that over the past you know, nine years, the Fed was just kind of buying 
its own bond, buying bonds. Because if bonds, if, if there's not a market for bonds, then interest rates can go up. So it's the Fed that was buying them to keep interest rates low. They're not doing that anymore. It's reversing. And so you see it almost every day that uh, rates are going up a little bit. So you can kind of expect that as to be a trend over the coming year. And that's going to cut in even more to the affordability issue that we're having. So that is why you see this slide, which is home ownership, the blue line, declining, and renter households increasing. And that's really where you, know, you come in, is being able to provide the supply that maybe the general public isn't going to be able to get at this time. Um, I, I know Bruce Norris had mentioned in his last presentation. I, anybody follow Bruce Norris? He's just he's wonderful, wonderful forecaster. And um, in his last report, he said that only three percent of renters today can actually qualify for a loan out of the forty-seven million renter households. And just CNN did a report. <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a bummer because we keep hearing how great the economy is, but then you hear stuff like this and it's like, ugh, it's still just, you know, we got some room to grow. Um, but CNN did a report where I think it was 60% of the population didn't have $500 in savings for an emergency. Anybody hear that? And then it was 70% that didn't have 1,000. So if you don't have the savings, how can you qualify for that loan? So there's going to be rental demand for some time. We've got household growth, not the ability to purchase. And so someone's got to purchase these homes, and it's, it's investors. Investors can buy them and provide uh, rental homes. So that brings us to number three, which is affordable housing. Um, that if we can provide that affordable housing, if we can do what the builders can't do, then we are serving an incredible need out there for affordable housing. I mean, it is, it is probably the, going to be the greatest news. You're going to see it every month. Every single month, I'm on CNBC or ABC News or something. They call, what's going on? You know, it's the same story. We don't, it's this. There's not enough inventory, and so prices are going up, but salaries aren't. So somebody's got to buy these homes. It's going to be investors, and they're going to rent them out. It's going to be a renter's market. That's, that's the story. That's going to be the story this year. And so the opportunity that we have is to solve that problem. And that's why when we bring in people, like you're going to hear later, like um, our Houston team, they're able to find properties way below what a builder could do, just way below, because they're finding old, dilapidated properties, and they're renovating them so that they're like new, they're, 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 I don't want to say they're new, but they're fully renovated to meet our standards at, at Real Wealth Network. And you can get those standards, our real income property standards, where we want things a certain way to be as close to new as we can get while still keeping it incredibly affordable. And so these teams work really, really hard to meet those standards that we have, because as, as investors, you, you know, you'd love a new home, right? That would be a great property to own and rent out but it's not going to cash flow. It, in some areas, like Brian's, Brian's bringing on some new, well, you guys are building new homes too. Yeah. For what price point on the new homes? What? 170 to 180. Okay. And the existing homes? Okay. So that's way below the average home price, you know, and it's way below, what, what are most builders at in Houston? Over 200. Yeah. So Sean's going to explain it, you know, later. But thank you. Um, so the, most home builders can't bring it in for under 200. You just can't. And um, but our people that we find to come here, they know how to find the deals. They know how to get the land for cheap. They know how to find distressed property and fix it up to stay at, at that affordable housing level. So if you can, if you can participate in that by by being able to to get properties for less than it costs to build and make it affordable for people, this is going to be in demand for a long time because builders can't do it. They can't do it. So this, is a, um, this slide is going to show you how things have changed a little bit over the last few years. And I actually had no idea. We have a, 
turnkey rental fund, which means for those of you who don't want to buy property and get insurance and you know you just want totally passive, we have a fund where our team finds the properties and does it all for you. And um, and they they're you know they're having a hard time just getting an eight percent return and. If it's our team having a hard time, it, it just goes to show you it's getting harder to get the kinds of numbers we used to get, even last year, for the very reasons I just said. Prices are going up, but wages aren't. So you can only raise your rents a certain amount, but you know, again, prices are going up. So that means cap rates are compressing. And this is, so this is where you can still get deals. And this is important. If you're really looking for cash flow, you need to know where to go for it, because what is gonna be frustrating when you're going down that stream in your boat and you're getting stuck and hooked on a tree and you're wondering why everybody else is flying by. It's because you don't have the knowledge you need to be able to flow. It, and that means you can't say, I want a nine to 14% financed return, but I wanna be in an A neighborhood with good properties in Dallas next to the new Toyota plant or the new Toyota center. That's not gonna happen. That doesn't exist. So you need to know what is out there and what exists so that you can be able to get the kind of numbers you want. Now, when I went to my friend, my friend really wants a 10% return. That's, she wanted this $2 million exchange. She wanted a 10% return. And she's done. She's out of the game. She's retired, right? And so I said, great. This is where you can go. She's like, but I want to go to Dallas. Well, you're not going to get that in Dallas anymore. Ten, five years ago, 10 years ago, you would have. Not today. Well, I, I want this school district. Oh, too bad. You need to buy in Detroit. <laughs> Sorry, Detroit, it starts with a D, you know. It's, it's not Dallas, but it's good. And, but she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. She couldn't get past her preconceived notion of what Detroit is. And so, you know, without knowing and having the right knowledge, you might not know where to turn for the deals today. But if you want these kinds of returns on property, and now listen, there's exceptions everywhere. You, maybe you could find this here, probably not, but you know, the, maybe if you Airbnb. I mean, there, there's exceptions to everything. You can find a deal anywhere. Uh, but in general, if you want these kinds of returns, you're going to have to give up a little something. So you don't get to be in a first tier market. You know, you're gonna have to be in maybe a tertiary market which is, by the way, exactly what the hedge funds are doing. They're, they're buying in these markets. They're not finding deals in, you know, no longer in Oakland where they were buying like crazy. Wish I, wish I had done that then. But uh, they're going here because this is where you can get the cash flow. If you're after cash flow, you gotta just choose one of these places. <laughs> and you know, I didn't put Houston on there, but they're close. You guys are like around 8%, 7 7%. Seven. Yeah, so Houston's on my next page, but you can, in parts of Houston, also get this. So most areas where you're going to get high cash flow today, it's going to come with some kind of baggage. You just have to know that going into it and be okay with it and kind of know, again, how to work around it. So Cincinnati, this is, this is one of the hottest places to invest now. So you might just be like, but why? What is there? Well, our, <laughs> Missy's here somewhere. I think she's out there in the blue. Um, and she can she could talk to you. Oh, there she is, right there. <laughs> why Cincinnati? <laughs> Cash flow, right. So um, who you you bought in Cincinnati, right? He he did. No, he did. Yes. You you did, yeah, okay. Why did you choose Cincinnati? I looked at the different markets, and I found my return on my investment was higher in the Ohio area. Yep. It just bottom line. Yeah. When you first were showing me Houston and Alabama and different areas, it just it was a little higher there. So I took the plunge and very happy. So what did it take to get over, you know, not going into a first tier city? going I want to, to Ohio. I don't know that I want to admit what that took. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bought one house, and it meant a lot. I mean, it, everyone has their own threshold of risk. Yeah. And when that did really well, then I just kept going. Yeah. 
and, and it just kept flowing with what I, I liked that the fact the cash flow statements I'm actually outperforming what she was showing wow that's pretty exciting awesome so I can't you can't ask for better than that Thank and you. she stands behind her property she stands behind and so it's like the main thing you vet out the people that have that integrity mm -hmm. and that's what I really liked because I was invested in California and being happy like you were showing with not making but it's gonna grow and then 06 hit yeah. and the 07 crash and oops yeah that. it can wipe out pretty quickly correct very quickly yeah awesome I'm happy enough that I bought a friend <laughs> <laughs> hello friend <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I do, I want to say, like, we do vet, and we vet thoroughly. And at the same time, we, we, we're not there for every property. So you've also got to do your vetting. You've also got to do your due diligence. I mean, you know, the best way I can put it is, like, what if one of our providers who has been just blowing minds for, for five or six years and making so many investors happy, but then they, they went to this morning's breakfast and there was poison in their food and their brain got crazy and then they, they didn't know numbers anymore and even though they had this great track record, they were a little loopy and they sold you something that wasn't great. I, I'm, I'm just, this is just hypothetical. So you still, even though they have gone through our system and they have a track record, you still, it's your responsibility to look at every deal and do your homework. You got to, all right, just in case they had a bad meal. <laughs> no, but uh, it's really important. But thank you. All right, so Cincinnati, Cleveland, you know, all of these areas just, again, they come with a little bit of, um, you know, baggage. D Detroit has a lot of baggage, but if you go and visit, you will be shocked. How many people have been there and gone on tour? Were you surprised? Yeah. Like it was better than you thought? Right? I, I was blown away. Anybody thought it was still just a dump? <laughs> no? You could be honest. All right. Okay, so there are parts of, of any city that are, that are not good. But you want to be in the, in the path of progress. And we choose cities that are reinventing themselves. It's just like if you want to make money on a property, you find a distressed property, and you fix it up, and you make a bunch of money. So it's the same concept with markets. We only want to be in markets that are fixing themselves, that are on the path of progress, that are improving. And, and we know that by looking at how they're reinvesting. When Rich and I first went and bought in Dallas, Dallas, I mean, it's hot today. Back then, it was no more popular than, than Indianapolis or Kansas, whatever. Any of these cities that aren't your flagship cities. Dallas was a joke back then. People were, people were just like laughing at us, like, oh, nothing happens there. You know, there's high taxes and they, there's nothing but land. You'll never see prices go up. And they were so wrong. You saw this slide. Prices have gone up there probably faster than anywhere else because we saw the city reinventing itself. It had gone through a massive savings and loan crisis and hit bottom. And then they completely, re they changed everything and said, we're not going to be dependent on oil anymore. We're going to have a diverse economy. We're never going through this kind of recession again. And they changed. And they, made, they had tax incentives and, and invited businesses to, to come to this business-friendly environment so that they would have diversification, which they never had. They were dependent on oil up until, I don't know, to, I think it all started to change after the SNL crisis with new, uh, new leadership. And now, what do you have? You have a city that has probably the most job growth of anywhere else in the country. It worked, and Houston probably being second. And so that's, but back then, nobody knew that. Nobody was investing in Dallas. Rich and I took a crazy risk. But we saw the fact, we saw that in the little area that we bought that there was a new freeway coming in, we knew that would have a bump to prices. So that's what we're looking for in these cities. Um, you know, Cleveland's having a total revitalization. Uh, Columbus is like a fashion center, who knew? Um, Detroit, massive, massive revitalization. If you go there, all you're gonna see is cranes and, and development. It's, it's amazing the amount of money going in. Chicago, still the third largest city in the US, but home prices haven't caught up. You can still get great cash flow there. And even though there's some, some issues, there's major issues in Chicago with their pensions, but that's kind of everywhere but you're seeing growth. And it was Chicago actually made the, um, the list for possible Amazon headquarters. So they see some, 
something there. Um, Birmingham, Huntsville, big military, big military place. We have a president who's putting, putting money into military. We're, we think Huntsville's got uh, a lot of cash flow with possible growth. And Kansas City, Indianapolis, both just areas growing rapidly. So you can get the high cash flow, and you also might get the equity pop. But it doesn't matter. That's not why you're buying. You're buying for the cash flow, and you might just get some growth too. Yes? Can you just explain what the dynamic portion is? Yeah. Yeah, so um, when you buy these properties all cash, you're probably going to get around 7 to 9%. But if you finance, you increase your return, yeah. um, at least right now. As interest rates go up, that may change. But right now, if you can still lock in fairly low interest rates, you can dramatically increase your cash flow by financing. Which brings me to this slide. So this is my um, kind of 10-pack. This is something I've been teaching for years. I know a lot of you have done it or are in the process of doing it. And it's, it's getting to a position where you own 10 properties. And, and the way that, and financed. So, you can, you can qualify for up to 10 loans with Fannie and Freddie, so you can lock in a 30-year fixed rate at less than 5%. That's amazing. Interest rates are going up, but they're still at historic lows. 5% is amazing still. So you can you know, buy 10 properties conventionally through any of our lenders. We have a whole list of lenders, it, you know, and, and we're talking about, you know, in, this, in this case, let's just say a $100,000 property. You're talking about an $80,000 mortgage, a $400 payment. You can qualify for that. You know, my daughter can qualify for it. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like qualifying for a car payment. You can do this. You just need good credit, and you, you can improve your credit. So this is something anyone could do. You do need the down payment, but you can do that too. You can save for that. So a, a down payment on an $80,000 property is $16,000. So this is, this is something you can save for. This is something anyone can do. And if you can buy a property a year, or if you have $200,000, you're like, well, how do I... How do I turn this into a million bucks? This is how you do it. And this has been my way of showing people you can become a millionaire in 12 years by buying $100,000 properties that cash flow. And the way it, would, it, the way it would work is if you bought, this is a real property in Detroit, $80,000 that rents for $950. With expenses and reserves, there's about $350 in, in expenses and then let's say a $300 payment. So you would have roughly $300 in cash flow on one property. If you were able to get to a point where you had 10, it, you would have $3,000 a month cash flow, right? If it's 300 on one, 3,000, what would that be at the end of the year? It would be $36,000, right? Did I get that right? So $36,000 cash flow on a portfolio of 10 properties in Detroit. I don't care what you think about Detroit. This works. So now you have $36,000 in cash flow. How big is the loan on that first house? It's 60 grand. How quickly can you pay off the loan on that first house just off the cash flow? Two years. So you can own that home free and clear. Now you have more cash flow. Now you go do it to the second house and the third house and the fourth house such that within about 12 to 13 years, you could have them all paid off through someone else's money, through your tenants, uh, paying off this for you. Now, do you think maybe in Detroit that property might be worth 100,000 in 10 years, 12, 13 years? Yeah, so it's not gonna double, maybe it is, but maybe it'll just go up a little bit and it's worth 100,000, but you have 10 of them paid off. You have a million dollar net worth. And now you don't have a loan and, and the income coming from that is substantial. So this is, this is one of the strategies that you can use in these cash flow markets. You want to buy the right property in the right neighborhood, um, but this, this is doable. It used to be doable in Dallas. It used to be doable in um, where was that, you know, Phoenix and, and Vegas, but all of these areas are, are too pricey now. So if you want to do that sort of a 10-pack plan, you're going to have to go to a place where you can get about 300 bucks cash flow after all is said and done. So this is just kind of an accelerated payoff to show um, you know, your 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which by the way, load up on them. Load up because interest rates are going up. And even <laughs> they're still so low, it is one of the most valuable tools you can use. And each person who's working can usually get up to 10. 
So I, I can't express enough how valuable it is to load up on your Fannie approved loans. Um, but you know, because no other country's got a 30 year fixed. It makes no sense to the banks. It's not a good deal for them. It's a great deal for us. Because imagine in 20 years, you know, 10 years, what are interest rates going to be then? But you're locked into today's rates. I mean, it's, it's incredible. That's something you don't necessarily get in multifamily, although I'm hearing that there are some fixed rates. Uh, but this, this is one of the benefits of single family homes to be able to lock in low interest rates for 30 years on 10 properties. And if you're married and both working, that's 20 properties. I guarantee you that, what is it, $300, $400 payment it, it is going to be a lot higher in 10 or 20 years. So as inflation takes off, you are locked in. And as rents go up, that's just cash flow to you. But if you make an extra $1,000 payment on a $100,000 loan, you could pay it off in 22 years, and this is per year. And if you make an extra $2,500 payment per year, you could pay it off in 17. And if you make an extra $5,000 payment, you could pay it off in 12. So that's why when I talk about the $300 cash flow, that can, that can translate to that last one, which is the $5,000 a year. If you could pay that towards the loan, you can accelerate that payoff very quickly, if that's your game. You know, some people are like, no, I don't, I just, I want the cash flow now. That's fine too. But that is one way to get to a point of retirement if you weren't really sure how. So these are uh, the best growth markets today. And when I say growth markets, I'm not talking like San Francisco or Portland or Seattle or Denver. Obviously, those markets have just exploded. But what I'm talking about is growth markets where you can still get that affordable housing, the houses that are around $200,000 or less, um, ideally under 250, because that's where the builders just cannot seem to bring in the inventory. So if we can take over that market, not only do we provide an amazing service, but we have the majority of people who are in that price range that need a place to live. So when, I, when I'm talking about growth markets, I mean growth markets where you can still get a a property for under 200,000 in a decent neighborhood. So Jacksonville, Tampa, Orlando, Atlanta, Houston, DFW, you know, you're not gonna have the nine to 12% returns. You're gonna get around five or six if you're lucky in these markets, that's how much it's changed. But the difference is these are maybe, you know, the second tier markets for people that are just like not willing to go to Detroit. It's okay, you don't have to. If you wanna be in sunny Florida, you're just gonna have to take the hit on cash flow. But what you do get is, uh, is the growth. So this slide shows the population change from 2014 to 2015. And you can see where people are moving. They're definitely moving to the upper northwest because, you know, let's face it, California, you know, California drives a lot of the economy. And when you've got 10,000 people turning 65 every day and looking for a way to retire, one of their options might be to move out of California because of the high taxes, because of the high prices. They can sell their house, they can go retire somewhere comfortably. And, and so they can go retire in Washington and Portland. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be a good cash flow market for you. But where on that map do you get both? Texas and Florida. So you get, you've got massive amounts of people moving to these states that have no state income tax, that are cheap, that are warm, that are a nice place to retire. And, and this is where you can, if you want to be, if you want to give up a little cash flow, but be in that growth place, that's, that might be the, that works for you. And this, this just came out last week, the U-Haul traffic flow. Anybody follow these? They come out every year, like where did people move last year? So where did the most trucks head to? And, um, and it was, number one was Texas, which is why we have our Houston team here to tell us what's going on there, but right? Number one place that people are, are you hauling off to is Texas. So, you know, there, there's several um, reports that come out. There's the United Van Lines and, and so forth, but there's a difference between United Van Lines and U-Haul. What's the big difference? No. Money, <laughs> right? Money. Um, if, if you have a corporation moving you, you might use United. If you are moving yourself and you, you're just going to go get your first job and whatever, you know, you're going to U-Haul it yourself. And so U-Haul kind of represents the more, the people that would be within our affordable housing range. So number one place they're going is Texas, probably because of the jobs. Number two, Florida. So it just kind of interesting to see there. And 
Kathy, can I point out number yeah. 50? Can you read out number 50 is California. Oh, California. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's hauling their stuff here. All right. So <laughs> that's important. That's important to see. Yeah, I, I did not notice that. All right. Yay, California. So this is a, was last, a study on last year, um, highest job growth from, I think it was CNN, but Jacksonville came in number one, Houston number 16. I picked these two cities because they are cities that you, where you can get that price point under 200,000, but still be in an area with high, high um, job growth. So on top of everything I just said, you get this, you know, you get tax benefits on top of all the cash flow. We didn't include cash flow benefits, uh, you know, tax benefits in the cash flow we showed earlier. So this is on top of that. It's different for every person. Talk to your CPA, but I got to say, you know, love him or hate him, Trump is a real estate investor, and these tax benefits are good for us, for real estate. It's probably not great for anyone else, but for real estate investors, it's amazing. So a lot of the deductions that we already had stayed intact, and then we got a little more. So, um, you know, a lot of people are concerned that you can't write off your mortgage past 750000 but that's not going to affect us. So um, not, not that much. Um, what you still get to write off when you own investment property is everything. You, know, you get deductions after deduction after deduction on, on all this stuff, plus an added uh, accelerated uh, depreciation on things. Um, things did, uh, our Ryan Shellhouse, the CPA that we work with, um, has put together a way to identify what like someone like Sean's team in Houston has done to renovate the house. And a lot of that can be accelerated depreciation uh, at like five, whatever it is. You can write off even more now the stuff that was renovated within that house. Not all of it, but uh, Brian Shellhouse has a worksheet that you can go through and then turn in uh, what more you can write off through that. But Mortgage interest, property taxes, insurance, maintenance, repairs, professional fees, education, and travel. These are all things you can deduct on your investment property, not your primary. So homeowners did not benefit from this tax reform. Investors benefited. So it, it, when homeowners are having such a hard time getting their first home, it, it's not, it was not made easier for them, but it was made easier for us to provide a rental home. That's just how it is. Um, depreciation means that you can write off the structure over a 27 and a half year period. So you would, let's say you bought a $100,000 home, you can write off the structure, which might be $80,000 of the $100,000 home. You can't write off the land. So usually you can take 80%, talk to your CPA, but you would take that you know, $80,000 on a $100,000 home and divide it by 27 and a half years and get this deduction of around 2,900. Again, if you bought 10 homes like we talked about, that's $29,000 annual deduction just on depreciation. Now, you, there's rules around this, and you can't make over a, a 150,000 or whatever. I mean, you, you, you may not be able to use all of these deductions if you make too much money, but talk to your CPA because you might be able to use it later. Also, if you have a spouse who does not work, then you need to a really good CPA. <laughs> be <laughs> yeah, because that spouse can be the manager of your properties and then can take all of these deductions. And it can be against your earned income. So again, these are things that you could talk to your CPA about, but it's really, really great. If you are ever wanting to be extremely grateful that your spouse doesn't work, this would be the time. <laughs> Because they can literally save a lot of money, right? Rich, uh, there was a while where we just sort of put all the, in, uh, I'm not going to say this on stage, it might be recorded. Ah. <laughs> anyway, Rich was not working for a while. He was managing our properties. <laughs> that is working, yes. True. Mm -hmm. You just have to be married. So, yeah, I mean, you just have to be married. So, Does the spouse own the property or manage it? Uh, you know, it, I, it's my understanding it doesn't, they don't necessarily have, 
necessarily have to be on title, but probably should be, but talk to a CPA. Um, but they, they would need to, to show 750 hours of activity on those properties, whether it's talking to accountants or visiting the properties or something. And it's, it'd be difficult to get those kind of hours if you only owned a couple. So you need a, a pretty good portfolio. But when you have that, you can literally get to a point where the spouse who maybe has a high income, there's so many deductions that you pay almost no tax. All right. What was that? Oh, so, oh, yeah, let's go back. I don't know if I'm going to do that right. There we go. Um, so this was new out of the new tax law, and I talked to your CPA for sure, but um, one of the benefits was that if you have an LLC and income flows through to you from the LLC, you get a 20% deduction on that income. Again, it's different income levels that might not get the benefit, but definitely talk to your CPA. And most investors hold their properties in LLC, so it affects most of us in a positive way. And then, of course, there's the 1031 exchange, which if you ever want to sell the property, you can sell it and get uh, replacement property and defer those gains and not have to pay it. Okay. I sound like Trump right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, let's move on. So um, the, next, the fourth way of benefiting, uh, or the fourth strategy today, is providing new housing. And this is, a, um, this is something that we kind of fell into and now have become known for and, and very good at because we have attracted these just world-class developers one who's in the room and maybe can join us. Fred, I'm going to just call you on up. This is, come on up, give him a hand. Fred Bates, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see and, you. And I can reaffirm a lot of what you were just talking about. I was uh, surprised to hear that you were featuring some of the things that we just talked about in our office just as late as yesterday. And one of those is we can't find good deals <laughs> and, you know, for, for me, a good deal is only a good deal so long as it's a good deal. And that means it has to pencil today, not tomorrow. So we don't speculate on anything. And of course, you know we have two positions in Reno right now. And in our first position, we have a, basically a zero land basis in that project. And our finished lots are at about 50, 55,000 all in. In our second position, Quest, um, we bought that from ourselves, basically, and our position is in that is that we will be in our lots under $100,000 finished, and we'll be up, in, well, we're up in building models now, and we're selling homes here. We, we have our first release in February. But I say that in listening to what you were saying about how these markets go sideways, is what happened last night, I was at dinner last night and another developer came over and told me something that just had happened in Reno. This particular developer is a developer that we were trying to buy land from as late as four or five months ago. But he was asking $262,000 for finished lots. And I thought that excessive. I've been talking to some of the other developers up there, they thought it was excessive. However, somebody, institutional money, that's what's starting to happen now, they're always the last ones on the scene, they come on. They're, these guys that I was talking to last night are in their project, I think they're upside down in it. They bought the project, they bought in, brought in some <laughs> private money at a real high rate. Now the private money's scared they went out and got some institutional money. So if the original bought buyer bought it at 60000 or $60 million, it was a good deal and could have worked. But he wasn't comfortable. He went out and he got a, another investor to come in, and they came in, took him out, and put up another $40, $50 million. And now they've got somebody coming in at about $150 million, setting their money on the sidelines. But that's going to drive these lots even higher. And I was just thinking, for your investors, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one of them yesterday that was in Reno at our job site, looking for houses in the Reno area. It's probably too late now that institutional money is there. But wow. 
Yeah. So a good so, subject that you were talking about today. <laughs> we're, we're, at the, we're the same place. We, I was telling my people that we probably, we were always Bay Area builders. Myself out of Carmel, California, typically built in the Bay Area. We built in five other states, including Florida, Nevada, Arizona, um, Oregon, um, and what? Anyway. Florida. The, yeah, if we got the floors in there. But, oh, yep. <laughs> but right now, and we tried and we stayed pretty much in the Bay Area. Right now, I'm telling our people, it's like for the older guys in here, they would remember the move, the television series, Have Gun, Well Travel. In other words, they went where the job was, and that's what we have to do for housing. And you were showing, you said tertiary markets. I hardly <laughs> call those tertiary markets. They're, um, some of them are reviving markets, but they're big marketplaces. Yeah. We're even looking at secondary markets, smaller markets than that even, because um, people are moving into those markets. We follow the same trends that, uh, that you were pointing out here too, so anyway. Well, Fred Bates, <laughs> stay up here though. <laughs> so, we, he, he makes us look so good, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we, we just, by luck, got introduced to Fred in 2010. And um, it was one of our members who said, you got to meet this guy. And 2010, if you remember, was like the, that's the heart of the recession. It may have even been right before that. But um, you know, they said, you got to meet this guy. He's been through so many market cycles. He's a 40-year you know, veteran uh, developer. And the banks just come to him and unload stuff because they know he'll know what to do with it. And he had a lot of stuff that he could, he could get from the banks for real, real cheap. And so he came to us with, um, with this opportunity in Portland that uh, these townhomes were almost completely built, but, um, but the bank failed and the developer couldn't finish them. And so Fred was able to tie it up for $3 million when the loan alone had been $13 million, and came to us. And I remember at the time saying, yeah, but Portland is just a mess right now. Like, it, it just was like nothing but inventory. And there were all these downtown condos just sitting empty. And it was really scary to do anything in 2010. And I just remember saying to you, yeah, why do you want to take on these townhomes when there's across the street nothing but empty condos that won't sell? And I don't remember what you said to that, but it was enough that I said, all right, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it turned out. Well, basically, basically, it goes back to that, a good deal's a good deal, so long as it's a good deal. We, our basis was so low. The previous developer had these houses, these condo units, 80% complete, the loan was $13 million, but they had substantial equity beyond that. We were buying out the dirt and the 70% completed units for $3 million. Hmm. Finishing costs were gonna be seven, seven and a half million dollars, whatever it was, I can't remember right now, and gross sales were going expected to be 12 to $15 million, um, and that was in just a recovering market. And of course, our first home that we sold there, we sold I'm going to say in the 400, $450,000, our last one was a million dollars. So we hit it right on. But it was the opportunity that, that we were going after. And I, I think that's, that's really the key is that it was the heart of the recession. Like it, it, people were, it was like tent city in Sacramento, you know, like people just living in their tents. It was a terrifying time. Our, our, like I said, our economy flatlined. And so even then, he was able to see, you know, these, there's, these are waterfront condos in Portland that are a quarter or a half of what they would normally be, and there's a market for that even in the midst of a horrible recession. And so that's, that's important to know for Reno because there could be a recession, you know, but, but would these properties sell in the middle of that? And there's the question. <laughs> so, is it, did we get it cheap enough that we could? Our, our basis is such that, yes, we can. We're, we're because of the market today. We're building a very nice home on our first project. As a matter of fact, we had our first release. As you may recall, we were talking about having homes starting in the maybe the high fours. Our first release, I had to really fight to bring one house out. We released five houses. That release will be effective. It'll, it'll, our blast will go out February 1. I'm sure they'll all be sold by then because 
them. We have a wait list for them, so they're calling on the wait list. But every month we'll be releasing five homes and selling five homes. But we have one house at just under 600,000. Everything else is substantially above six. Every release from here on in will have a 1% increase, so it kind of gives you an idea where these houses are going. And if it's too hot, we'll take it up 2% or 3% or whatever so that we can keep the market kind of in tune with our, the speed that we can build these at. So how many, do we have Reno investors in here? We've got quite a few, wonderful. All right, so um, I know there's some updates, but this, I wanted to bring Fred up to help you see the, um, or just to share why this is number four in opportunity, because we know that there's lack of supply, but you got to bring the supply on carefully, because you don't want to be like builders last time around who just got wiped out. So how do you bring on the supply knowing there could be a recession or there could be a boom? What, you know, what, we don't know which way it's going to go. How do we protect ourselves in that? Um, and, and the job growth is probably the key. So um, let's see, El Apple held, held a groundbreaking ceremony just on Wednesday with Tim Cook there. Um, so what, what was that about? Well, they're doing two new, one was, um, was already anticipated. Um, one of their build outs was anticipated. Um, the other one is a direct result of this repatriation of money the money coming back to the U.S. So they're going to do two facilities out there. They just closed on another large site at Trek. Their groundbreaking is at the Trek site. And again, last night, sometimes going to dinner is very uh, informative. Um, a fellow came over to me and said, did you hear the news? Trek closed their last 65,000 acres. This is probably the biggest industrial park in the world. They're totally sold out. Now, what that means to Reno, um, Google's in the ground, obviously Apple's in the ground, and so many other um, companies that I'm not aware of are coming in there. But just the jobs from building the new expansion is putting a strain on housing. When we started these projects, when we first started talking about what we were talking about, they had a demand for 4,500 to 5,000 homes a year. They've upped that to 6,500 homes a year. And they're falling back at the rate of about 1,500 homes a year. So that just compounds things. That's why we're getting that big surge in pricing. All right, and then of course the Tesla building, um, a $5 billion, 18 million square foot gigafactory with an estimated 10,000 new jobs, but actually an additional 10,000 jobs on top of that to support the 10,000 jobs, you know, in terms of the restaurants and, and massage, parlor, whatever, whatever else needs to be up there. <laughs> oh, we're talking about Reno, yeah. <laughs> if you go out and you see that job, it's a city, just the construction site is a city. It's a, it's a mobile city, you know, it's like um, these modular type things in there, but they're the offices for all of the people. Facing your, like that. No. They're the, they are the offices for all of the construction people that are building this. There's 7,500 people working on that job alone, the so building so. of Tesla. So about available housing inventory at a five-year low, which is driving, of course, home prices up because you've got fairly high-level workers coming in, being flown in from the Silicon Valley. Um, they, they see these prices as a, a deal for you know really nice, much bigger homes. But 6,500 new homes needed, which is up from last year. So job growth growing faster than housing, which is exactly the position Rich and I were in 10 years ago, where job growth in, in Dallas was, was much faster than housing. It couldn't keep up. So you know our, our little project is, what, 250? Um, what, what do we have? Uh, 273, 273 units. 73 units. It's going to make a tiny dent in the 6,500 homes needed. But that dent is going to be real good for the investors. So um, one of the, and the average home price now has gone up to 500,000. And, and that's Reno. I say that because the difference in Reno from Sparks, if you average the two, it's about 450 for new homes. Yeah. So, um, 
that's kind of where the project is. Um, unfortunately, this particular deal is for accredited investors only. There are a few uh, openings left in it. If, if anyone wants to participate, if you uh, an accredited investor means you either earn two hundred thousand dollars as an individual or three hundred thousand as a couple, or have a million dollar net worth, not um, excluding your primary residence. This is not something I made up. I think it's ridiculous, but it's the law. Um, basically, if you talk about an investment publicly, which I did, um, then you have to, it, it kind of goes into the crowdfunding world, and then only accredited investors are allowed into it. So um, the way that we structured this, given the environment, and this is some of the things that you can take with you when looking at deals like this, is, is to make sure that a project like this isn't going to take too long, um, and then could withstand, because you're talking about building, so it takes a while, and could it withstand a recession? So we structured it two different ways uh, for people who just want total security. They just don't want to take risk. I mean, there's risk in everything, but this would probably be the, the lowest kind of risk, is being a lender. Because as a lender, you're kind of you're the first one that gets paid. Um, over the equity investors, and you're secured to the property. And uh, it's a very good investment for self-directed IRAs because it doesn't trigger UBIT taxes within your IRA. So we structured part of it as debt, and um, that at 12.5%, which is really amazing considering the LTV is, I don't know, around 30 or 40%. It's, I think, Two or th like four million will be the max no, on a yeah, it's, twelve million dollar property. And nothing. I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's very, very secure. We structured that for self-directed IRA investors who don't want to pay tax within their IRA, but also for people who really just want security. Let's just say we went into a massive recession of historic proportions, and you're in a, you know your first position on a twelve million dollar property at four million you know, that you do that investor group, then that property could lose half its value and you'd still be ahead. And if you had to foreclose, you'd still make a bunch of money because you get the equity. So it's, it's a very secure position. Then on the, the flip side, we also have the equity piece where you can make a 15% preferred plus part of the profit. And those um, returns are, I think originally were projected around 25%. Yeah, and I think that that's, holding in it and going up with, uh, obviously, appreciation. Um, we're doing two things there. One, you were talking about you know, what happens if the, the market goes down. Obviously, we've increased the quality of home slightly because that's what the demand is for and they're willing to pay that. And so there's plenty of room on the downside if we want to cheapen those homes. Bottom line, we're, we're in there right on the land price. Yeah, with other institutional Builders coming well, just, in paying you know, a lot more. Private and public builders are. Yeah. Uh, there's nobody new coming in there that isn't up around 160 some thousand for a finished lot. Amazing, and our lots are at what? Our, our our initial lots have a zero basis in the land and are mm -hmm. finishing out at about 50 to 55 thousand, and our Quest lots are finished finishing out at 90. Five ninety-eight thousand. So still under market. Way under market. Way under market. All right. So here's just some. These are the model homes being built there. That's December. Um, right now, um, two of them are dried out completely. Roofs on, windows in, and everything. The other two will be all dried out within the next um, week to ten days. Um, siding will be going on. Um, we're doing the the. Pads are created for production lots. We're in the street now doing trenching, bringing in the utilities, wet and dry, and we will be starting production shortly. Wonderful. All right, so there's the timeline, and all of this is on the website. You can, if, if you're logged in, you can um, click on Reno and find out about it. Yes? What kind of buy-in do you 50,000 minimum. And, and just kind of a clarification of what Kathy did. We had a first tranche, which was all investor money. We raised $8 million. She set aside $4 million for those people that had pension plans that, what is that, UBIT tax? UBIT yeah. tax. 
and it was making it tough for them to invest in our projects. On that last four million, I, I was talking to Maggie just the other day, 50% of it is coming in on the loan side and about 50% of it is coming in on equity. So you can go either way, obviously. We structured it both ways because um, you know, it's, it's tough to pay double tax in your IRA. So if you're investing your IRA money uh, and into any kind of active business, you can pay up to uh, over 40% of your profit in your IRA. And then when you take money out of your IRA, you pay again. So that's awful. But if, if your return is 30%, you pay 40% of that, you know, some people are like, oh, I'll, that's okay, I'll do it. Um, and, and if you only put 50,000 and it's a little bit lower um, on the U, but, but we structured the debt because debt is considered passive and it doesn't get taxed like that in your IRA. You can invest your IRA in it, yep. You have to self-direct it. And we have um, several companies we can refer you to for that. Yes, do you have a question? Yes. Oh, I wish, yeah. He, the question was, can a 1031 exchange into it? Um, no, you can't exchange into um, like an LLC with other partners. But we are working on something like that uh, so that in the future, if your clock's already ticking, it won't be set up. But um, there is something called a Delaware Statutory Trust, which we will set up some of these in the future, which would allow you to 1031 into it. Yeah. Okay, we got to wrap up. All right. Well, any last Thank question you. for Fred? Yes. Yeah. So if you're an equity investor, which means you're part owner with Fred, you get 15% preferred annually, plus 30% of profit. So it ends up being, with today's prices, around a 20, 25, 26% per year uh, profit if all goes as planned, but we actually think the values will continue to increase. So values have increased, but costs have gone up a little, so it's not quite as dramatic, but still still very good. Yep. Costs have gone up substantially, yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Fred. Thank you. <laughs>